Rahman Rahim. In the name of Allah, the most merciful, the most gracious. Uh, before I introduce our speaker and before he begins, we'll have a short recitation from our brother of the Quran in Arabic and then he'll do a short translation of it. Okay. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Malik Yawm Al-Din Iyaka Na'bud wa Iyaka Nasta'in Ihdina Sirat Al-Mustaqim Sirat Al-Ladhina An'amta Alayhim Ghayri Al-Mawdub Alayhim Walam يوم يجمع الله الرسل فيقول ماذا أجبتم قالوا لا علم لنا إنك أنت علام الغيوب إذ قال الله يا عيسى ابن مريم اذكر نعمتي عليك وعلى والدتك إذ أيتك بروح القدس تكلم الناس في المهد وكهلا وإذ علمتك الكتاب والحكمة والتوراة والإنجيل وإذ تخلق من الطين كهيئة الطير بإذني فتنفخ فيها فتكون طيرا بإذني وتبرئ الأكمه والأبرص بإذني وإذ تخرج الموتى بإذني وإذ كففت بني إسرائيل عنك إذ جئته بالبينات فقال الذين كفروا منهم إن هذا إلا سحر مبين وإذ أوحيت إلى الحواريين أن آمنوا بي وبرسولي قالوا آمنا واشهد بأننا مسلمون إذ قال الحواريون يا عيسى ابن مريم هل يستطيع ربك أن ينزل علينا مائدة من السماء قال اتقوا الله إن كنتم مؤمنين قالوا نريد أن نأكل منها وتطمئن قلوبنا ونعلم أن قد صدقتنا ونكون عليها من الشاهدين قال عيسى ابن مريم اللهم ربنا أنزل علينا مائدة من السماء تكون لنا عيدا لأولنا وآخرنا وآية منك وارزقنا وأنت خير الرازقين قال الله إني منزلها عليكم فمن يكفر بعد منكم فإني أعذبه عذابا لا أعذبه أحدا من العالمين وإذ قال الله يا عيسى ابن مريم أأنت قلت للناس اتخذوني وأمي إلهين من دون الله قال سبحانك ما يكون لي أن أقول ما ليس لي بحق إن كنت قلته فقد علمته تعلم ما في نفسي ولا أعلم ما في نفسك إنك أنت علام الغيوب ما قلت 
قلت لهم إلا ما أمرتني به أن اعبدوا الله ربي وربكم وكنت عليهم شهيدا ما دمت فيهم فلما توفيتني كنت أنت الرقيب عليهم وأنت على كل شيء شهيد إن تعذبهم فإنهم عبادك وإن تغفر لهم فإنك أنت العزيز الحكيم قال الله هذا يوم ينفع الصادقين صدقهم لهم جنات تجري من تحتها الأنهار خالدين فيها أبدا رضي الله عنهم ورضوا عنه ذلك الفوز العظيم لله ملك السماوات والأرض وما فيهن وهو على كل شيء قدير صدق الله العظيم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم Be warned of the day when Allah will assemble the messengers and say What was the response you received? They will say, we have no knowledge Indeed, it is you who is the knower of the unseen The day when Allah will say, O Jesus, son of Mary, remember my favor upon you and upon your mother when I supported you with the pure spirit and you spoke to the people in the cradle and in maturity. And remember when I taught you writing and wisdom and the Torah and the gospel and when you designed from clay what was like the form of a bird with my permission. Then you breathed into it and it became a bird with my permission. And you healed the blind from birth and the leaper with my permission. And when you brought forth the dead with my permission. And when I restrained the children of Israel from killing you. When you came to them with clear proofs. And those who disbelieved among them said, This is not, this is not but obvious magic. And remember when I inspired to the disciples, Believe in me in, and in my messenger, i.e. Jesus. They said, We have believed. So bear witness that indeed we are Muslims. And remember when the disciples said, O Jesus, son of Mary, can your Lord send down to us a table spread with food from the heaven? Jesus said, Fear Allah if you should be believers. They said, We wish to eat from it and let our hearts be reassured and know that you have been truthful to us and be among its witnesses. Said Jesus, the son of Mary, O Allah, our Lord, send down to us a table, a table spread with food from the heaven to be for us a festival for the first of us and the last of us and a sign from you and provide for us and you are the best of providers. Allah said, Indeed, I will send it down to you, but whoever disbelieves afterwards from among you, then indeed will I punish him with a punishment by which I have not punished anyone among the worlds. And beware the day when Allah will say, O Jesus, son of Mary, did you say to the people, Take me and my mother as deities besides Allah? He will say, Exalted are you. It was not for me to say that to which I have no right. If I had said it, you would have known it. You know what is within myself, and I do not know what is within yourself. Indeed, it is you who is the knower of the unseen. I said not to them except what you commanded me to worship Allah, my Lord, and your Lord. And I was a witness over them as long as I was among them. But when you took me up, you were the observer over them, and you are, over all things, witness. If you should, if you should punish them, indeed they are your servants. But if you forgive them, indeed it is you who is the exalted in might, the wise. Allah will say, This is the day when the truthful will benefit from their truthfulness. For them are gardens in paradise beneath which rivers flow, wherein they will abide forever, Allah being pleased with them and they with him. That is the great attainment. To Allah belongs the dominion of the heavens and the earth and whatever is within them. And he is over all things competent.
give a brief introduction to our guest speaker. His name is Abdul Rahim Green. Uh, he converted to Christianity 16 years ago. And now, sorry. He works as an uh, English Dawa coordinator for the London Central Mosque and the Islamic Cultural Centre. And without further ado, I'll let my guest speaker take over. We begin by praising Allah and we praise Him and we seek His help and we ask for His forgiveness and we seek refuge with Allah from the evil of ourselves and from the evil consequence of our evil actions. Whomsoever God guides, there is no one to misguide <coughs> and whomsoever God leads to go astray, there is none to guide. And I testify and bear witness that Allah alone is worthy of worship and that Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, is the messenger of Allah. Muslims believe that Jesus Christ, the son of Mary, is a messenger of God. He is the Messiah sent to the children of Israel. He was born of a virgin. That he is the messenger of God and that he is a messenger of the religion of Islam. I remember when I told my aunt this. My aunt, like my mother's a Catholic. My mother's originally from Poland. So when I told my aunt this, she said yes. So Muhammad, so, uh, so Jesus is a Muslim and his religion was Islam, so Muhammad must have been a Jew. She was being sarcastic, of course. So, yeah. But she didn't really understand, obviously, what really I was saying or what I meant by that. So I think the first thing we'd like to do today is explain what we mean by Islam. Islam refers to two things. There is Islam, the general religion that we believe is the primordial religion. It is the religion of Adam and we believe it is the religion of all the prophets. And then there is Islam in the specific sense, meaning that which God revealed to the Prophet Muhammad. Both of them we refer to Islam. But Islam does sometimes have that specific sense and sometimes it has that general sense. The Quran refers to the prophets as being messengers and to their message as being Islam and to their followers as being Muslims as you heard for example from the recitation from the Quran that our brother just recited for us. It mentioned that the Hawariyun, which is the name of the Quran, gives the helpers, the disciples, and they say, we are from the Muslimun, we are from the Muslims. So I think it would help if we understand these terms. And I think if we understand them, at least on a very basic level, most of us uh, perhaps would reach some agreement about this, uh, uh, this issue. What do we mean by Islam, therefore, in the general sense? As I said, the primordial religion, but we believe this is the one religion that the one God has revealed for the guidance and for the benefit of all mankind. In its generality, what does it teach? What does it preach? It essentially teaches and upholds that there is one God. There is one God, one Lord, one creator, one sustainer of this universe. And that worship should be directed to God alone. This is its foundation principle. There is one God, one creator, one sustainer, one controller of all things, and that worship should be directed to God alone. And that the means of salvation for the human being is by submitting themselves and surrendering their will to the will of God. A 
They do that through obeying His commandments. And those commandments are made known through His chosen messengers. God has chosen certain individual human beings to carry the message that human beings should worship God alone and that they should submit to His divinely revealed commandments. Now, those messengers, in a sense, had a dual purpose. Some of them, we call them Nabi. And others, they are referred to as Rasul. And there is a difference between a Nabi and a Rasul. The Nabi, a Nabi is someone, or let's start with a Rasul. A Rasul is someone who is given a message. They are given a message. It is a unique message in the sense that there is something that qualifies it and distinguishes it from other messages that God has given to other messengers. It doesn't mean that it teaches anything different about God. It doesn't teach anything different in general about how do we become close to God, how do we worship God, how do we attain salvation. But some of the details of those laws by which the human beings live are different. A Nabi tends to confirm the message that has already been brought by a Rasul. So a Rasul brings a message and a Nabi will confirm that message. Why does God send these messengers and Nabis? Obviously, initially to bring the message, but there is also another very important purpose. And to understand this, and to understand more about Islam, and to understand about more about our whole topic, let's go back in history. This is not perhaps a piece of history you are familiar with, because this piece of history is based upon what we Muslims believe God has revealed to the Prophet Muhammad. But this piece of history that is taught to us in Islam tells us how idolatry began. How did human beings begin to worship idols? Now, as a side point, we know that generally sociologists and anthropologists today and historians have adopted the idea and the concept that human beings, and this is in accordance obviously with the theory of evolution, okay, move from a state of polytheism to monotheism. This is what they believe. They believe human beings originally were polytheistic because they emerged from their more ape-like uh, ape-like existence and became more and more human. They therefore developed uh, uh, a type of religious, uh, spiritual sensitivity. And initially this was manifested in worshipping everything. Everything that seemed to be more frightening. Everything that seemed to be more powerful than them. The storms, the sun, the moon, uh, the, maybe even the trees, the rivers. They all became objects of worship. And then sometimes these objects of worship, they were given names and they were given manifestations in the form of idols or various, uh, uh, various figures. And, and around these figures there evolved a mythology, a creation myth, a story of how the world came into being that was linked with these idols and these spirits and so on and so forth that they used to worship. But as this evolved, as they claim, human beings left this nature worship and they began slowly and slowly as they became more and more complex to worship fewer and fewer gods until ultimately this idea of a single divinity, a supreme being, this is its uh, penultimate manifestation. But as they will claim eventually when people get enough knowledge and they get enough understanding they will really understand that in fact there is no God at all. However, Islam does not agree with that claim. Rather, the Quran teaches us exactly the opposite. First of all, we don't believe that human beings are a product of random mutation of DNA. We don't believe that we have evolved from apes. We don't believe that we have evolved from a common ancestor from apes. We believe that God literally took some clay with his hands shaped the figure of a man 
and gave life to that man who was the first human being, Adam. And from the rib of Adam, he created his wife, Hawa, Eve. And from Adam and Eve have descended all of us sitting here today and every single human being. This is what we believe. And we believe that the religion of Adam was monotheism. And the religion that God has placed instinctively and naturally in the human being is the recognition that there is one Lord, that there is one Creator who is distinct and separate from His creation and that He is the Lord, the Cherisher and the Provider, the Rub, as we use the word in Arabic, Lord, the Cherisher, the Provider and that He alone is worthy of worship. And this was the religion of human beings. The descendants of Adam followed this religion. And one of the Prophet's companions, Abdullah ibn Abbas, he mentioned that the people of Noah were upon the religion of Adam for ten generations. The people of Noah were upon the religion of Adam for ten, for ten generations. Then amongst them some pious people died. And when these pious people died, when these pious individuals died, the people began to grieve. And they were in fact excessive in their grief. Now I didn't tell you the story of the fall, how Adam and Eve came to be out of paradise, and how the devil tempted them away by eating from the tree. You're probably familiar with the story, which we Muslims believe is all literally true, not a symbolic story, not an explanation of some uh, Garden of Eden is some state the human beings were in of innocence before. No, it literally is true. It's our history. That's the true events of human history. That's how we came to be here on earth. So for ten generations, they were following this religion of Adam to worship God alone. Some pious people died. And then Iblis, the devil, who we don't believe, by the way, is a fallen, fallen angel. Angels in Islam are considered to be, um, they cannot disobey God. It's impossible for them. They worship God and they never disobey God. So there is no possibility for an angel to disobey God. It is not in their nature. God did not give them the free will or the option to disobey Him. Obedience to God for the angel is like we need to eat and breathe. They need to obey God and worship Him. In fact, Iblis is a jinn. A jinn is another type of creature that exists. Human beings, their essence is clay. The angels, their essence is light or nur or light. And the jinn, their essence is smokeless fire. Iblis is from the jinn. So Iblis, when he saw the people mourning after their pious, four of these four people, very pious, they died. So Iblis came to the people and made a very interesting suggestion to them. He said, listen, why don't you place statues of these pious people and pictures of these pious people in your homes and your places of gathering? So that when you see them, you will remember God more. It's a very interesting thing. How is it that the devil, Iblis, is telling the people to do something that is going to make them worship God more? So the idea is, they'll see the picture, and I'm going to go and do a sin. I'm off to go and meet that very pretty girl over there, right? And I see the picture of that pious man, and I feel ashamed. I remember what a good man he was, so I remember God. That's the idea. You remember God more. But the devil has a long-term plan. So the people do this. They build these statues, make these pictures, put them in their houses, put them, put them in their marketplaces. But then, as the people, this people, they began to they began to commit more sins. And then as generations passed, they begin to forget why their ancestors made these statues and made these pictures. And then the devil comes to them again and says to them, the only reason that your ancestors made these statues and made these pictures is that in your time of need and distress, you could use them as intercessors and intermediaries between yourself and God. And this is the nature of a people who begin to indulge in sins. 
When people become immersed in sin, they begin to feel that they can't talk to God. They can't pray to God. They can't communicate with God. We're too unholy. We're too unclean. We're so immersed in sins, God is not going to listen to us. This is, what, this is the psyche of people who are used to committing sins. Therefore, they believe they can't approach God anymore. They can't go directly to God. So what do we need? We need an intercessor, a pious person. God will listen to him. God will listen to her. God will listen to that person because they were pious. Oh, I'm just me. I'm just what? I'm a sinner. God ain't going to listen to me. So this is how idolatry started. Idolatry started and then the people began to supplicate to these dead people, in fact, they were dead. And this is how the people moved from an innovation to idol worship. They were calling upon someone or something other than God. This is supplicating to someone other than God. And this is an act, in fact, we could say, this is the very essence of what worship is. The very essence of worship is supplication, is calling. Seeking help from something that is distant. That is the essence of worship because it shows the human beings need and dependence and reliance upon God. It means they recognize that that one can hear them, can help them and has power over all things. And you are hopeful that that will be answered. And you are fearful that that supplication will not be answered. So this is the essence really in fact of what worship is all about. The very emotions that worship contain is contained in this issue of supplication. Yet they began to they began to put these supplications to these dead people. And the dead cannot hear the living. This is what the Quran tells us. In Naka Latus Mu You can't make the dead to hear. Calling upon a dead person is like calling upon a brick. A brick cannot harm, it cannot help you, it cannot do anything. The same with the dead. And this is how idolatry started. So what happened? God sent a messenger. God sent a messenger to remind the people of where they had gone astray. And it's important to note here that these people believed in God. They believed that there was a creator. They believed that there was a Lord and a sustainer. And the same thing in fact we find with the pagan Arabs. The pagan Arabs to whom the Prophet Muhammad came they believed in God. The Quran says, Kul ma rabbu samawati sabah wa rabbu al-amshir azim sayakullu lillah. If old Muhammad say, ask them, say to them, who is the Lord of the glorious throne and the Lord of the seven heavens and the Lord of the glorious throne? Sayakullu lillah. They'll say to you, it's Allah. They'll say that it's God. God is the Lord of the glorious throne. He's the Lord of the earth. And the Quran asks in other places, who sends down the rain from the sky? Who causes the crops to grow? Who causes the living to die? And who will bring the dead back to life? They will say, it's God. They believed in God. They believed in God's existence. They believed He was the Lord and the controller and the sustainer. But this is not what made them disbelievers. They were not disbelievers because they failed to recognize God's existence. They were disbelievers because they gave acts of worship to some things that they should only have given to God. So they made something a partner and a rival with God. And this is universally the experience and this is universally the purpose of the messengers. Fundamentally, first of all, God sends messengers to remind people of where they have gone wrong concerning their acts of worship that they should give to God. They have begun to worship things, creatures, created things. They began to give them the love, put in them the hope, the trust, the reliance, supplicate to them, do uh, uh, sacrifices in their name, swear in their name, and so on and so forth. And all of these things are in fact acts of worship that should only be given to God. So this is why God sends messengers to remind people, first of all, of that. And then also to remind people of the way that they should live their life. Things that are anyway, we could say, universal. But things that still people need quite often to be reminded about. Because often we find, again, that people do things 
in the name of religion. They attribute things to religion. But it's in fact not from God. It is something they have invented. Again, if we look to the pagan Arabs, if we look to the pagan Arabs in the time of the Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, they had a whole series of acts of worship apart from supplicating to their idols, they would sacrifice to them. They, for example, would have certain camels that they would leave. And those camels they would dedicate to God, or they would dedicate to their idols, and they would not touch them. And they had certain rules and certain taboos. One of the things they used to do is to bury, sometimes it was their custom to bury their baby daughters alive. They would bury them alive, and they would consider this piety. So that's another thing, that's another reason why God sent messengers to correct people's concept of what in fact religion is, of what are the actions, what are the deeds that are pleasing to God, and what are the rules by which and through which the human beings should live their lives. This is the purpose of the messengers, this is the purpose of the prophets. Now, we believe the Qur'an mentions the names of many messengers. Noah is one of them. We believe that essentially Noah came to call people back to the worship of God alone. Not to believe in God, as I said, because they did. Most people, in fact, they already do. Believe in God. Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jacob, Joseph, Solomon, David, John the Baptist, Jesus, they are all mentioned in the Quran as prophets, messengers of God. Either some of them, like Moses, they were, they carried a message. So they were not only, not only were they Nabis, they were also Rasuls. They were prophets, but they had their own unique, distinct message. There was different. What Moses brought in terms of law, in terms of the actual details of how to worship God was not the same as what was given to Israel or Jacob, which was not the same exactly as what was given to Abraham. So Moses in that sense brought a new law. Although the essence of his message was the same. No one I think would essentially argue with the statement that Moses called people to believe in one God that they should worship God alone, that they should dedicate their acts of worship to God, and that the means of attaining closeness to God is by following the law and the commandments which God had sent down. That translated into Arabic is Islam. And a person, and Islam means submission to the will of God. That's what it essentially means. And the person who does that, therefore, is Muslim. Someone who submits themselves to the will of God. Now, the Prophet Jesus. We believe that Jesus taught Islam and that Jesus was a Muslim. And that much of what came to be known as Christianity, rather like the people of Noah, rather like the people of Noah, who we describe the situation, people innovated. They introduced, in fact, originally piously, with good intentions, but they introduced innovative beliefs and innovative practices concerning Jesus, until ultimately what became known as the religion of Jesus was not lo any longer Islam. It was no longer that message which Jesus originally transmitted, but a totally new and innovative religion that in fact, that in fact in reality, is a form of idolatry, a form of uh, worshipping something other than God. Because it means that Someone is attributing some power, some act of worship, some qualities to a creature that should only be given to God. This is the essence of really what idolatry is. So when someone claims that Jesus is God, that he's literally God, then of course this is a clear manifestation of giving to a creature, a created thing, some attribute and some quality that only belongs to the Creator. 
or even if one was to worship or believe that that human being is an intercessor between themselves and God and one is to direct a certain type of love towards that human being there is a certain type of love that should only be given to God so who has gives that love to other than God has made that thing equal with God now the question is there's obviously a difference a very big difference in the way that Muslims and Christians perceive Jesus all I want to do today is outline outline some some factors that Muslims would put in defense of the Quranic position concerning Jesus now obviously there are many different ways that we could approach this subject. One of them is just to say, well, you know, it's like a point of view of faith. We believe the Quran is the word of God. The Quran teaches this and this and this. Therefore, we believe it's from God. Therefore, that's it. That's what we believe to be the truth. That is one point or one main way in which we could defend our point or defend our belief and defend uh, our opinion. Okay? And of course, this is what the Qur'an does say. The Qur'an clearly states, that as the brother read some verses of the Qur'an, it mentions, for example, just there, uh, how Jesus will stand in front of God on the Day of Judgment. And God is going to ask Jesus, Oh Jesus, did you say to the people to worship yourself and your mother as deities besides God? And remember what we said here, a deity does not mean necessarily that you believe that thing is actually God. Because some people would say, well, what Christian, and who, who amongst the Christians says that Mary is a God? Maybe we, uh, we say Jesus is a God, but not Mary. No, but a deity in Islam does not simply mean that we believe this thing is a creator or a sustainer. No, as we've already explained about the pagan Arabs. Anyone who gives any attribute or any act of worship to someone or something besides God, then they have made that thing a deity and they have made it a God. So Jesus will say, uh, and God will ask Jesus, did you make yourself? Did you say to the people, worship yourself and your mother as God's interrogation of God? And the reply that you mentioned is, glory be to you, you're far removed from every imperfection. How could I say such a thing? How could I say something which I don't have any knowledge of? You know what is in me, and I don't know what's in you. And I didn't say to the people anything except worship Allah, worship God, who is my deity and your deity. So according to this, Jesus had a God. And Jesus worshipped that God. And Jesus called other people to worship that God. And that is the one God, the God of Abraham, the God of Moses, and indeed the God of Jesus. The Quran also tells us and, and also, so because the Quran, we believe also, if you read it, is revealed for the Christian. It's revealed for the people who call themselves Christians. There are references in the Quran, calling to the Christian. Oh, Ahlul Kitab, all people of the book, the Quran says. God is calling out all people of the book. Don't go to excess in your religion. Don't speak about God anything except the truth. Do not say three. Your God is one God. The Quran tells us. So in many places the Quran is calling out. To the, and in fact the Quran specifies that one of the reasons that God has revealed this book is to make clear to the people. And to make clear specifically to the Christians those areas in which they have gone astray. So this is one of the purposes of God sending a messenger, Muhammad, and sending the Qur'an to clarify those issues where the people have gone astray from the original guidance and the teachings that God has revealed for humanity. Now there are a few issues. That is one way we can approach it, but I don't want to go that way today because it would just really involve going through the verses of the Qur'an and reading the different things, but I will refer to them indirectly. Another way that I would like to approach it is that is a more historical perspective. And I think this is a little bit more interesting, a little bit more challenging, and it's not something, uh, certainly it's not
not something that I was familiar with when I was being brought up, uh, when I was sent to the monastery, and you know, I was brought up in a Roman Catholic monastic boarding school, but it's the, what I'm going to talk about today is not something I was familiar with, and to some Christians it may come as a shock, or it may not, perhaps uh, people are a lot more educated in these things uh, than I was in those days, but this is information that I began to find out uh, later. Uh, after I embraced Islam, I began to read various books and then this, I began to discover this information. And I found this information quite shocking. I actually felt as if I had been cheated. I felt as if I had been lied to. And similarly, a friend of mine, uh, who was also Catholic, from Gibraltar originally, I gave him a certain book, it's called Jesus, the Prophet of Islam. And when he read it, he said, I feel I've been lied to all my life. How come nobody ever gave me this information? So some of us brought up as Christians, we imagine, we imagine that Jesus walked on the earth teaching the doctrine of the Trinity, teaching the doctrine that he had come to die for the sins of mankind, uh, and that was the way to salvation. And we imagine also that the Christian followers, the followers of Jesus, went around believing and preaching the same thing. And that's what they lived for and that's what they died for. And plenty of them died. Martyrs, there's no doubt about that. But the real question is, is that actually the historical fact? And the reality is, no, it's not. In fact, what we know as the Trinitarian doctrine or is sometimes referred to as scholars as Pauline Christianity or Western Christianity is only one of many different interpretations and many different ways of thinking about Jesus. It's just one doctrine amongst many, many doctrines. And so it is very interesting that when you begin to research and when you begin to look into the origins of Christianity and we begin to ask this question who was the historical Jesus? We want to know the Jesus of history not the Jesus of dogma not the Jesus of mythology and this question is not an old it's not a new question it's an old question the first people the first people who really began uh, well, the first man who really began to look at this question, I think he lived in about the, 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 the 15th or the 16th, uh, sorry, the 16th or the 17th century. His name was Osfara, uh, uh, his name was Rhymarius. He wrote, he was the first person to explore the issue of the historical Jesus because he believed that by looking at the Gospels, he could see that there was a big difference between the Jesus that was talked about in the Gospels and the Jesus of dogma, the Jesus of even we could say mythology, the Jesus that this is what we believe, such and such, this and that, this and that, okay, but there was a difference between this creed and this dogma and the man that we could read about in the Gospels. Of course things have moved a lot further than that because now there is the whole issue of questioning, which was not really present then, but now the issue is questioning even the validity of the Gospels. How valid are they as historical documents? How much do they actually represent what Jesus really said and what Jesus really did? And this is a very, very big and a very, very important question. Now some people may argue, and I haven't seen this documentary myself, but a friend of mine was talking about it here. He was watching a documentary where a whole group of Christian clergy were talking about, yes, it's true, uh, the historical Jesus never said uh, this, he never said that, he, he probably never said that he was the Son of God, he probably, he almost definitely never claimed to be God, almost definitely did not claim to be God. Uh, the doctrine of the Trinity is an evolved doctrine. And the idea of salvation through redemption, through uh, the, the death of Jesus on the cross, also is probably not something that Jesus taught. But it doesn't really matter. Because what matters is what Christianity does for people. Now, I'm sorry, but, you know, you know, I just can't accept that as a proposition. Because... What we have to say is that if Jesus never taught the Trinity and he never taught that he was God and, 
And he didn't teach that uh, he came to die on the cross. Well, what did he teach, first of all? And if he didn't teach that, you mean a whole religion has been invented and attributed to this man? And he never taught it? And he never said it? And, I mean, come on, let's be honest. I mean, people have been slaughtered. Countless millions of people have been slaughtered in the name of this doctrine and this religion. And I'm not saying that's not a way to judge whether Christianity is true or not. That's not what I'm saying, because you could say the same thing about Islam or even Buddhism. It's not a criterion to say whether a religion is true or not. But what it is something to say is that, look at the consequences. How can you honestly say it doesn't matter? It does matter who was the historical Jesus. It does matter what did Jesus really say and what did Jesus really do. It is important. Because if he didn't teach the Trinity, if he didn't teach that he was God, if he didn't teach that he died on the cross for the sins of mankind, then in reality the whole basis upon which Christianity is built is false. It is therefore a false religion. It is therefore a claim that this is a means to salvation, which is not a means to salvation. Now, my proposition is that I agree with those people in the sense that I don't believe Jesus taught the Trinity. I don't believe that Jesus said that he was God. I don't believe that Jesus taught that he had come to die for the sins of human beings and that that is the way to salvation. I think and I believe that this is an evolved doctrine. This is a doctrine that gradually, bit by bit, evolved. That it is not so much that the world was Christianized or that Christianity conquered the West. It is just as much, in fact, that the pagan world, which it was at the time, paganized Christianity. So what we found taking place is a synthesis, a synthesis of some aspects of Judaic monotheism and some aspects of, in fact, a whole mixture of things, a whole mixture of different things. Those things could include paganism, the, the, uh, what they call the mystery cults, which is a subsection of paganism, uh, and also aspects of philosophy. All of these had a very big influence on uh, the, the, the evolution of what is now the Christian dogma. Now, I think it's very important to understand something. What it, let, let's, you know, sometimes we, we live in our little world, and I think history is so important. It's so important, someone called it the study of dead men. But I think that, okay, but I think this is just a ridiculous thing to say. History is very important. And also it's very important to look at things in context. Let's look at the world at the time when Jesus was around. Okay? The first thing is, is that it's a world full of God-men. It's a world full of men who are gods. It's a very easy concept to accept that there is a man-god because at that time, at that time it's easy to accept, because at that, time, at that time it was common. There were two to a penny. In fact, every Caesar was considered to be a manifestation of God on the earth, or he was a God on earth. Pharaoh was a God. Alexander the Great was considered to be a God. In fact, the gods themselves, Apollo and Zeus and Aphrodite, they were always depicted in the forms of human beings. And then you had a whole series, and this is something very interesting, this is something that really began to interest me, and the more and more I studied it, the more and more I realized that, wait a minute, this is quite extraordinary. When we look at the mythology of some of these pagan gods, we find a very frightening and a very stark similarity between what Christian dogma teaches and what these pagan religions also taught. And we find a very strange type of universal belief. When we look at we look at Adonis, we look at Baal, we look at Mithra, we look at Osiris, we look at these various pagan deities, and we find that when we study their mythology there is a very common theme to all of them. And the common theme is this that they were all born on or around the twenty fifth of December. They were all born on or around the 25th of December. For example, Mithra was born in a cave. Some of them, it's claimed that they were born of virgins. And the other thing that we find is all of them 
find are nail to a tree bleeding, some are slaughtered and sacrificed, some their body is divided up into bits. But in one way or another, again, we have the common theme that this is a sacrifice through which and by which human beings are saved. And that by participating in this sacrificial feast, and very often we find that the, the, the body of the God is symbolized by bread and its blood symbolized by wine. What we know quite often as the Eucharist. And it's extraordinary to find this common theme. Now, I wasn't the first person to know this. Extraordinarily enough, early Christians also noted it. They actually also noted it. And you find some of the Christian writers saying that the devil has fooled these people and has imitated the Eucharist and our rituals. And they even mention some of the details. They're even down to such and such and this and that and such and such. One, for example, cult was Mithra. Mithra was even the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And Mithra was also involved in a trinity of gods. This trinity of gods was Sol in Viticus, Mithra and Saturnalius. Now, the first thing that this challenges is, therefore, the concept of a man God dying and being killed for the sins of human beings is absolutely not new at all. It is a very common pagan mythological concept. And it's in fact all originally tied in with nature worship. Of course, December is the time when you have the winter solstice. That's when the sun is dying. So the sun dies, and the god is sacrificed in order to speed the return of the dying sun. And the, the resurrection of that god is celebrated at Easter, of course. Easter is the time when what happens at Easter? The leaves start coming back on the tree. Why do we have Easter eggs until this day? We have Easter eggs because that's when the birds lay their eggs and the bunnies come out. And it's the time when everything comes back to life. Okay? So, December winter, winter solstice, Easter, resurrection, the return to life. It's a common pagan theme. Even the idea of someone or something being the son of God in some type of literal sense. It's very important to understand that uh, from one perspective, it seems very, very hard to accept the proposition that Jesus could have gone around preaching this thing. Jesus was a Jew. The Jews stood out amongst all of the people on the whole of the earth for their uncompromising adherence to monotheism. Their refusal to worship pagan gods. Their refusal to follow these pagan rites and rituals. In fact, their ultimate undoing was because what? They would not offer sacrifices to the Roman Emperor. They refused to do it. So, it seems extraordinary that a people whose existence has been dedicated and who stand out perhaps amongst all of humanity as people who worship the one God and refuse to worship idols and who believe that Salvation comes through obedience to God and to following His divine commandments should in any way, shape or form be ready to accept. And it seems extraordinary that someone from amongst them could therefore go and preach a religion which in essence does not seem to be very much different from those pagan cults and mystery religions that existed at the time. But it is not really difficult to see, and if you start studying history, it is not difficult to see how this amalgamation between monotheism and the paganism took place. As Christianity, as the original message of Jesus, the original monotheistic message of Jesus spread bit by bit, slowly by slowly, people began to exaggerate the position of Jesus. They Naturally, there, were, there was this competition. It's not like it is. There was a real competition between Jesus, our guy, and, you know, Apollo, and, uh, you know, whoever, Baal, and Mithra. And so it's natural that you want to exalt the one that you believe in. And as people come who are ignorant, who are Gentiles, not familiar with the whole tradition 
of monotheism that is really the Jews or the people that hung on to it, bit by bit, slowly, slowly, amalgamated these ideas. And then you had people philosophizing, introducing Platonism, trying to justify these ideas with intellectual arguments until uh, bit by bit, gradually, we have what we have today, uh, what we call Christianity. Now, it's, it's something that I've only introduced the idea. I've introduced the idea. But a few very important things that might be re worth researching into. One of them is the Council of Nicaea. The Council of Nicaea is a council that took place, very interesting event, in 325 AD. If you read about this and you research into it, what you find is a pagan Roman emperor, Constantine. He was a pagan. Now, the Catholic Church, and remember I was taught this at school, Constantine is supposed to have converted to Christianity. He is supposed to, on, on, on the way to a battle, he saw the vision of a cross. Now, the first thing is it seems extremely unlikely, in fact, that that was the means for him to convert to Christianity. One of the reasons is because the cross was not a symbol of the church at that time. However, the, the cross was a symbol of the invincible son. The cross was the symbol of the invincible son. In fact, some people believe that Constantine was the manifestation of Apollo, and Apollo was, in fact, the sun god. So this vision that he saw is unlikely to be the cross symbolizing Christianity, because at that time the cross did not symbolize Christianity. It symbolized the invincible son. So this pagan Roman emperor, Constantine, proceeding over a council of Christians, what did he want to do? It's very clear. He wanted to unify his empire. There was this vibrant religion, and in fact, study it, you'll find so many Christian groups and so many Christian sects arguing with each other. And this arguing was causing a lot of problems, a lot of divisions in the empire. He wanted them to unite on upon a single doctrine. The events which expired to produce what we know that now as the Athanasius, the Athanasian Creed, is what most Christians consider to be, you know, this is what Jesus taught. But in fact, in reality, what we find, it is a creed that was imposed upon the people. And that was also a very extraordinary event in the history of Christianity because there had never been considered to be one creed that could be imposed upon everybody. Up until that time, people were free to interpret the Gospels and to understand and come to their own understanding. But this is for the first time that this universal concept became imposed uh, upon, uh, upon the Empire. Now by and large, ultimately, this concept only became widely accepted in Western Europe. It was not widely accepted in North Africa. It was not widely accepted in the Middle East. It was not widely accepted in the very place where the message of Jesus had originated from. And it seems to be, the history seems to uh, confirm this, that in fact the Christians of Africa, of North Africa, and the Christians uh, in the Middle East were by and large monotheistic. They did not believe that Jesus was God. And they did not believe he was in any literal sense the Son of God. And in fact what we find happening is that when the message of Islam came, that they recognized this to be a continuation and a clarification of that message that Jesus had sent. And many, many, many of them willingly, not by force, uh, embraced Islam. Now, um, there are many different books that you can read about, not written necessarily by Muslims. Uh, some of this, a lot of this information, uh, for example, uh, there's a book that uh, I have here, The Origins of Pagan and Christian Beliefs. It's quite an old book by Edward Carpenter, written in the 1920s. But this book, for example, he compares many of the Christian doctrines uh, and shows and, uh, and furnishes examples of other, as I mentioned, Baal and Adonis and, uh, and Mithra and stuff like that, and actually discusses, you can actually read the similarities, you'd be quite shocked to find the right number of similarities. Uh, other books that you could read, in fact many, many books are coming out these days discussing this whole issue of the historical Jesus, what did Jesus really say, what did he really do, uh, the, the difference between the real man who really existed uh, and, and the Jesus of dogma. And I'm sure most of us would agree that really what we should be interested in is not dogma. We should not be interested in dogma. We should not be interested 
in some creed that has just been handed down to us and the only reason we really believe it ultimately is because that's what we've been told we have to believe. Rather we, I'm sure, agree that we should be interested and we should be searching for what did Jesus really say? What did Jesus really preach? The true Jesus. That's something that, you know, obviously I'm going to have to leave it for you to do because we don't have really time to go very much into it. But anyway, my only purpose was today to open up an avenue, something to think about, something perhaps to discuss about, an avenue of discussion where you might, we might all of us be able to look at things from a uh, fresh angle. Thank you very much. Uh, for this. Uh, thank you very much for that very interesting talk. Well, now I think the floor is open for any questions regarding any information the speaker said, or any other questions you would like. Uh, could you please raise your hands and then I'll attend to you. Okay, then, yeah, this is for you. Okay, well, a couple of questions. First of all, why do you assume that, um, the way you're tracing the Trinity back to other pagan beliefs, why do you assume that those pagan beliefs uh, came first, not the Trinity. For instance, for, as Christians, we believe that right from the beginning, God revealed himself as the Trinity. And um, therefore, these pagan beliefs could have come from that. And we see that evidence even in the Old Testament scriptures. For instance, in Joshua, right back in the beginning, uh, this is what uh, is written. When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us? or for our adversaries. And he said, no, but time will the command of the Lord, army of the Lord. Now I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped, and said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? And the command of the Lord's army said to Joshua, take off your sandals, um, take off your sandals from your feet, the place where you're standing is holy. And Joshua did so. So we have, right back in the beginning, we see multiple texts in the Old Testament of people worshipping, um, not just someone in the heavens, but someone who appears. There are three laws in the Old Testament. So two questions. Okay, there's two ways I can approach this. First of all, I could deconstruct the, the passage that you wrote, uh, uh, that you read, sorry. Uh, and I don't think that passage at all says, at least very clearly, what your faith says. That's the first thing. Uh, I, as you're reading it, I'm picturing the situation. Uh, and I don't know if you read the words exactly in detail, but the words do not say what you claim they say. Now, if an angel came down, if the angel came down and said, I'm a messenger from the Lord, and this is what the Lord says, and I fell down and worshipped, it doesn't mean I fell down and worshipped the angel. If God, if God sends a messenger, I fall down and prostrate. In fact, you know what? Even if something really good happens to me in my life, right? I, I fall down and worship. Who do I worship? God. I don't worship the good thing that happened to me in my life, okay? So the falling down and worship means that he fell down and worshiped God. So even the passage that you quote doesn't really support your statement. But the real problem I have with, with what you're saying is this. The real problem that I have with what you're saying is this. Is that, first of all... Um, your proposition is not really accepted by any except uh, what I would call Christian fundamentalist scholars. In fact, it goes against the whole grain of history. Because if we are really saying that the Bible always taught the Trinity all along, how do we explain the whole history of Judaism? How do we explain Jewish theology? How come we don't find in the writings of the rabbis, uh, in the Talmud, uh, clear explanations and propositions of the Trinity. You see, this is the question for me, is that what, you mean these people to whom this book was revealed for thousands of years just didn't get it right? We don't find them talking about the Trinity, we don't find them expounding the doctrine of the Trinity. In fact, what we don't even find early Christians talking and expounding the doctrine of the Trinity. The Catholic Church itself admits in the Catholic Encyclopedia that the doctrine of the Trinity is something that evolved. So you're making a claim, but that's your claim. It doesn't seem to be supported by history. It doesn't seem to be supported by fact. And it would seem extraordinary to me that if this was what the Bible taught, then the people to whom the Bible was revealed completely missed the point. 
use the strawberries. So, okay. Well, I'll just come back. Um, first of all, um, well, in, in the rest of the Bible, when we see people by and die, when an angel appears and starts to worship, the angel always rebukes that person. We see in examples in Revelation of that. Um, so, um, and also people, when they see this angel, of course, think they're seeing God face to face. Okay. So, uh, and that angel speaks as a Lord also. So that doesn't stand up that. Secondly, you're incorrect to say that ancient Jews did not believe in a Trinitarian concept of God. They never used the word Trinity or described it in kind of Greek philosophy. But you see, for instance, in the Targums, they speak again and again of the words of the Lord, who stands as an intermediary between people and God. You see in Philo, where it talks about again the words of the Lord, being an intermediary who is not made like us. Um, there's multiple references in ancient Jewish texts, but of course we won't believe what modern day Jews believe because they projected their Messiah. Mm. I mean, I don't really, I, I can't think, I don't think we can use Philo as a point of reference because he was someone who was trying to synthesize Greek philosophy with, uh, the, uh, with the Hebrew teaching. So it's not really a very good example uh, to bring. You know, it's rather like uh, bringing in as an example of uh, Orthodox Islam, uh, perhaps Zaki Badawi, to take an example. Or, or someone, I, someone I can think of, an extreme modernist who is trying so desperately to synthesize uh, modern, uh, modern thinking with Islam. I, I mean, you couldn't bring him forward as an example of, uh, of, uh, of you know, a pure uh, Islamic uh, Orthodox thought. Um, and again, I, I don't really think that, that what you, you've put forward is really very convincing again. Uh, because although, yes, uh, modern Jews, uh, you're right, they rejected the Messiah, but their traditions and their writings and their traditions go back beyond that time. Uh, we can take the Dead Sea Scrolls, for example. The Dead Sea Scrolls is a good example. I mean, we have some documents that well, no one really disputes that, uh, 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 you know, from the time of Jesus, but we don't really find the concept of the Trinity uh, being discussed. And all you're really putting forward is some vague notions, some vague possibilities. We don't have a clear, why don't we have even from Jesus? Why doesn't he clearly tell us what the Trinity is all about? Why doesn't he clearly explain it to us? So, again, I, I don't really think you you know, really put a very convincing argument there. And, and one of the reasons why it's not really convincing to me uh, is that I don't really know of, of, uh, of anyone uh, who has really put forth this argument, except, except as I said, uh, you know, some fundamentalist Christian uh, scholars. Justin Martyr, writing up um, just 100 years after yeah. Jesus, uh, wrote the very same things. So he clearly believed in the Trinitarian idea of God. Yeah, that was 200 years before Nicaea. Yes, the idea, first of all, uh, what, what, what concept of Trinity does Justin Martyr put forward? It's not, it's, you see again, it's the, the idea of the Trinity is something that evolved. You have the, you have the Greek Orthodox concept of the Trinity is really subtly, or some, in some ways quite different from the Catholic version. And then we go back to the fact that, uh, as Eusebius writes in his book on the heretics, for example, uh, the existence of Christians who denounced the Trinity as being heretical. People who believed in Jesus, that he was the Messiah, that he was not God, that there was only one God, that the Trinity uh, was a heresy. So you have Christians, people oh, who have just attributed to themselves the Trinity, okay, Christianity, Christianity but refuted that concept. Okay, there's a question here at the front somewhere. Um, I want to thank you for the talk. Um, it was really good. Um, it's, uh, I've you know, just started occasionally hearing talks of Islam stuff and things. It's great to hear what you actually believe as opposed to what I think you believe. Um, and it's just one of the things you said at the start, um, and just now actually, that um, you believe Jesus is the Messiah. Um, and there's lots of things in the Old Testament, because obviously we study the Old Testament and look for references to the Messiah. And one thing is that he's given uh, by God authority over heaven and earth. Um, to judge heaven and earth. Um, and I was wondering, do you believe that? Okay. Um, so you see, the problem, the problem, this is the problem, is that if we have an idea, any idea, and we want to prove our idea, you can go to any book, I'm sure you can go to 
Holy Scriptures, you can probably go to the Quran and you can prove your idea by finding some references that seem to agree with your idea in that book. And it's my experience when I became a Muslim, I was confronted with another problem. I mean, I read the Quran and it seemed, okay, that's how I'm convinced from God, okay? But then I came to the problem that lots of different Muslims were telling me lots of different things. And they were saying, no, this means this, and this means this, and you should do this, and you should do that. And so I was confronted with another problem. So what's the right Islam? And this is the thing, is that what I really discovered is, and it's a very great danger, is that what people do is they have an idea. And they say, now, where can I find something to prove my idea? Now, I would say, I would suggest that, for example, Osama bin Laden, to take an example, has an idea. He has something in his mind, something he wants to achieve, some manner in which he would like to achieve it. And he will go to the Qur'an, and he will go to the traditions of the Prophet, and he will find something, without doubt, to justify his idea. And in fact, if I mention them to you, you'd say, oh yes, that's what the Qur'an says. But what he fails to do, in fact, is look at the whole thing. Or he interprets something specific, Without, he takes something that is, for example, it could mean this and could mean that, while totally ignoring a clear and unequivocal statement. Okay? So this is the problem that we have. So yes, you can have a doctrine and you can say, well, now let me dig through my book and let me find things to prove that my doctrine is true. But a normal reading and a looking at everything would not actually bring that to your mind. Okay? That's the other thing with the Trinity, right? Right? Like, I'm sure we can dig through the Bible and find lots of things that may seem to indicate that the Trinity is there. But the fact of it seems to me, from what I've studied, that the Trinity is a new idea that was introduced and that it is even admitted by Christians, like the Catholic Encyclopedia, that it's an evolved doctrine. Okay, so this is the thing. We can always go through books finding out bits and pieces to justify what we believe. But that doesn't mean, in fact, that's what was meant or that was, that was what is intended and that, that's what was, to, what, what was taught. Now, just to take one example I'd like to take. Um, I was an examining, I went to, a, a, I, I listened to a talk by someone called Shabir Ali the other day, a few, few weeks ago. A pretty similar subject, did a lot better than me, I have to say. Um, and... Um, there was a very interesting passage that came up, which I was sort of familiar with it, and I went to reinvestigate it. Um, and that is a passage in Isaiah, I think Isaiah 53. I think it's Isaiah 53, right, where it talks about the suffering servant. And uh, I read it, and I have to say, from all the passages I've read in the Bible, I said, well, that seems to, te- to me, it really does. He's pursed, pierced, he's crushed, he's this, he's that. It seems to really, you know, you can see how this suffering servant could be Jesus. You really could see, even I have to say, I'm reading it, and I could see it. But then, I thought to myself, well, there's a few things. Does everything about the suffering servant apply to Jesus? And the first thing is, no, it doesn't. Because he's talked, he's, it's talked about as he's ugly, and people cannot look upon him. And I don't remember everyone describing Jesus as ugly and looking upon him, uh, not being able to look upon him. And another thing, he goes on to live and bear children, okay, and, and, for, and so on and so forth. So uh, that doesn't work out. So although there are some things that definitely seem to apply to Jesus, right, there are also some things that don't. And then I said to myself, well, I wonder how, People, other people understood that. How did the Jews in his time, or the Jews before his time, understand it? Okay, uh, and then it seemed that obviously they had different interpretations, and they didn't have that type of interpretation uh, of it. So that's the thing. The point is, is that you can find something that seems, and even maybe very closely seems, to be fitting the idea that you have. But really what we have to ask ourselves is, what is this thing really saying in its original context? Okay, I'll hand off quite some time, sir. Thank you. Um, If Jesus didn't claim to be God, why then did the Jews make such a fuss about him and end up killing him? Okay. You see now, the problem we have here is, the the, the real issue that we have here is this. We, uh, as a Muslim, uh, and also actually purely from a historical perspective, I do not believe that the Gospels represent an accurate account of the life of Jesus. There are some things in there that almost probably did, Jesus did say. There are some things in the Gospels that have been attributed to him that are probably, in fact, interpretations or statements of his disciples. And there are some things perhaps that are just pure mythology. Okay? So how much of the 
the Gospels are fact? How much of the Gospels uh, are fiction? This is a question that, you know, I can't really answer from a historical perspective. So, the basis on which you're going to make your suggestion that, well, why did they kill him, you know, goes back to essentially believing that the information in the Gospels is true. Okay? But actually, even if we don't accept, even if we do accept generally what it says, there are lots of reasons. There are lots of reasons why they might want to kill him. Now, we know that the history of the Jewish people is replete with examples of them killing their prophets. In fact, as far as I remember, it's either in the Acts, or uh, either maybe Jesus himself is supposed to have said it, that you, you, know, you kill your prophets, you've killed your prophets. So, it's not something new, first of all, for the Jews to kill their prophets. When someone comes along with something and they don't like it, they're trying to kill the guy. Okay, that's the first thing. Secondly, let's look at the political situation. The political situation is this. Romans ruling over Israel. Okay? This seems to be a nice state of quo. The Romans rule, the Jews can practice their religion, they can worship in the temple. The Sadducees, the guys in charge of the temple, they don't want anyone to come and rock the boat. Now, as we know, and this also seems to be confirmed, is that the Jews at that time were waiting for a Messiah. And they expected this Messiah to be a guy who was going to come along, fight the Romans, chuck them out, and re-establish the imperial, we could say, instead of saying it, the kingdom of God, the imperial rule of God on the earth. In other words, Rome was going to be chucked out, the emperor was going to be chucked, the Romans were going to, because this is the Romans. Idol worshippers in the Holy Land is not acceptable. Okay, idol worship in the Holy Land, not acceptable. So they're expecting a political, physical Messiah, a guy who's going to chuck them out. Now, just suppose that Jesus was that man. Just suppose that Jesus was calling for what we could call now a jihad. Okay, against the, uh, against the, against the oppressive Roman imperialists. Okay, let us overthrow the world power. They are corrupting our land, calling for jihad, holy war. Um, then the people like the Sadducees, okay, they would have a very good reason to want to try and kill Jesus because number one, they're going to lose their position of power and influence. Number two, it means that he's come to rock the boat. They have reached this delicate balance of agreement between them and the Romans. So anyone who comes along saying these type of things is a threat, is a threat. There's lots of other interesting things, theologically, uh, very interesting. And Paul himself admits this, for example. The issue of Jesus being crucified. Now, it seems that the Sadducees, and this is an explanation, it's not a historical one, but it's just maybe my explanation, how can I reconcile what the Quran says with what, uh, uh, with, with what seems to have happened at the time. Okay? Because the Quran recognizes that, number one, but it seemed to people as if Jesus was crucified. So the Quran does recognize that for whatever happened, people got the idea that Jesus was crucified. The Quran recognized it. However, the Quran tells us that they did not kill him and they did not crucify him. Rather, Allah raised him up to himself. That's why in the passage that the brother read, okay, it mentioned that, and we saved you from those people who disbelieved in you. Because they tried to kill him. So there's no doubt, they tried to kill Jesus, and it appeared that as if they had done that, but God rescued Jesus and did not allow that to happen. That's what the Quran says. Okay? Why crucify Jesus? Why not poison him? Why not stab him? Why not? Because it seems that there is a, there is a, uh, there is a passage in the Torah, or something like that, that says that whoever is hung upon a tree is cursed. And in fact, Paul recognizes that. He says the crucifixion is a stumbling block for the Jews. How could God allow his chosen Messiah to be killed, let alone be crucified? Because if he was crucified, he's cursed. And then Paul goes on to try and explain that Jesus took the curse to take the curse away from us and so to remove the curse of the law. So he comes with a, you know, his argument and his, his explanation for it. Okay? But this is the issue, is that these Sadducees, they wanted to kill Jesus. He was upsetting the balance of power. He's a potential threat to their own uh, source of power. Okay? Uh, and that not only did they want to kill him, they wanted to make sure they did it in a way that they could really humiliate him. That's why crucify him. Because then the people would never believe that he was the Messiah. Yeah? So it's not necessarily because he was going around claiming that he was God. There could be other reasons for it. Uh, at the back over there. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I've got a quote here. Uh, Matthew 3, 17. Uh, and a voice from heaven said, This is my son, whom I love, with him I am well pleased. Also, Mark 14, 61-62. Uh, the high priest asked, Are you Christ, the Son of the Blessed God? Jesus answered, I am. That's also quoted in Luke 22, verse 17, and Matthew 26, 63-64. And John 8, 58. 
want to make him godlike. They want to make him more like God. They want to make him the son of God. They want to make him God. So they write these things and they write the story of Jesus in order to reflect that. It's not something, uh, it's not something strange. In fact, we can find exactly the same thing happening in the biography of Prophet Muhammad. Exactly the same thing. I can find you some biographies of the Prophet Muhammad or some for example, statements or stories concerning Ali, the cousin of the Prophet, that elevates him to divinity. They elevate him to divinity. They talk about him as a divinity. They may stop short of actually saying Muhammad is Allah, but they will attribute to the Prophet Muhammad qualities that only belong to God. And you find some groups of the Shia, for example, have done this with their Imams. Okay, they attribute to some these Imams infallibility, that they have control over the atoms of the universe, and so on and so forth. So this is, again, it goes back to how we started. Okay? People start speaking about God, without knowledge, they start adding things, they start inventing things. Do the Gospels, this is the question, are the Gospels actually what Jesus said, or are the Gospels a person's interpretation with his own doctrinal, uh, doctrinal interpretations put into it? That's the first thing we have to think about. The second thing we have to think about is this, okay? Yes, Son of God. But it's very interesting that we find the term Son of God mentioned in the Bible quite a lot. It's mentioned in the Old Testament. Israel is called my son. Verily you are my son. This day I have begotten you. David is called the Son of God. In fact, Jesus himself refers to, Blessed are the peacemakers. They shall be called the sons of God. And everyone is the Lord's prayer is our Father. This is very important. You see what? It again comes back to what we mentioned here. You have a doctrine. Now let me find something to prove my doctrine. But really, I think, on this issue, without doubt, if a person read the Bible from cover to cover, you will see, number one, lots of people are called sons of God. They are referred to as sons of God. Does this therefore literally mean that these people are literal sons of God? I mean, what does it mean anyway, son of God? Think about it. My son, if I brought my son along today, Hamza for example, or Abdullah or whoever, right? Okay, I say this is my son. We understand what we mean. I had relations with my wife, physical relations, and the son was born. This is my son. Now, most people would agree that the, the term son of God does not mean God had uh, intimate relations with a woman and the son was born. Because we don't attribute that to God. So clearly he's not physically a real son. Did God adopt this person as a son? Did he love that person as a son? Again, it doesn't really have a meaning. If I, for example, uh, if I, for example, brought, let's say, a, a dog with me to no, I don't want to speak. Some of the people accuse me of so comparing Jesus to a dog. I'm not. Okay, but I'm just trying to illustrate the example. If I brought a dog with me today and I say, "Here's James, my son," you say, "But he's a dog." He said, no, he's, he's my son, he lives within the house, he eats at the table with me, he's got a room in the house, the adoption papers are coming through next week, he's my son. He said, look, it's a dog, you are a human being and that is a dog, you can't have a dog, it's your son, it doesn't mean anything, okay? In the same way, similarly, God is God. God is the creator. God is different from everything in this universe. There is nothing that is like God. He is holy and he is pure. He is infinite and self-sufficient. <laughs> How does an infinite, self-sufficient, eternal, infinite being have a small little insignificant speck that are the human beings as his son? It doesn't, in a similar way, actually mean anything. So what we can really say is this term, son of God, if in fact in the original Hebrew they even understood it as son. Now it's very interesting that Hebrew and Arabic are both Semitic languages. They're both actually very, very similar. Yes? And one of the terms we use in Arabic, we have a nickname called a kunya, something called a kunya. Now my kunya is Abu Abdullah, which means I am the father of Abdullah. But sometimes people are given a nickname, and that nickname equates them with something they love. Yeah? So for example, there was a companion of the Prophet, they called him Abu Huraira. Huraira means kitten, the father of the kitten. Because he loved cats so much, it said that one day a cat was sleeping on his shirt. He didn't want to wake. He didn't want to wake the cat up, so he cut his shirt and left the cat. So he didn't wake it up, and he came to the mosque without his shirt. You know, the front of his shirt. They said, "What? Your shirt?" And he said, "So they called him Abu 
Pereira because he, love, he loves cats so much. But no one would for a minute think that Abu Huraira literally fathered a cat. Okay? No, it's just it's Semitic usage of the Semitic language. And this is another problem. When we take the usage of one language and then we apply it to our own doctrines and understandings, it's in fact very easy to see how some of these things that even the passages you mentioned on the concept of Son and God, take that out of its very uh, monotheistic uh, Jewish context and take that over to the Roman pagan Roman Empire where Heraclius, you know, where Hercules, he's the son of a god, right? And you've got all these sons of gods, and in fact, the gods actually do sleep and have intercourse with the women on the earth, and they beget demigods. You can see they would take this, interpret literally, and easy for them to come with this understanding that somehow something is a son of God, half god, half man, or whatever, you know, God. But is that the real understanding that was held at the time? This is the question that we have to ask. Did it really mean that? Or is this an interpretation that has been hoisted uh, upon it? Uh, do you have a question on this side? Okay, then. Um, going back to your um, earlier point about seeking the truth and how we can bring things to, to a passage. The passage didn't really originally detect. Um, how is it that you propose within your framework of reference um, that that is somehow better than ours? How, how is it that you propose you reach the truth and we don't? Okay, I have this is such an interesting question. And I'm hoping someone is going to give me an answer to this. Because now that you said that, you know, the question, please. Oh, yeah, sorry. This is a very good question. He's asking that. Uh, basically, the short, the long short of it, what is the framework? How do we understand the truth? And how do we come to know the truth? And why is my way of finding the truth better than someone else's way of finding the truth? Okay, it's a very, very important and good question. And I would love someone to tell me, if you're a Christian, right? Okay, would anyone from amongst the Christians like to give me the criteria that you use to distinguish truth from falsehood. That's what I want to know. But I'm going to forewarn you. I'm going to forewarn you. Whatever criterion you give me, we are going to apply it universally. It's very simple. If it's good for the goose, it's good for the gander. Right? Yes? If your religion is true because of this and this and this, then any other religion that fits that criterion also has to be true. And I'm not saying, therefore, you could, you, and you can't, this is not fair to say, the criteria of the truth is that if you believe Jesus died on the cross for your sins and that he's God and the Son of God and the Trinity, therefore, that's the criteria. Because, no, that's the issue we're discussing and we want to find out whether it's true or not. Okay? So what is the means that you use in order to understand whether anything is true or false? So if anyone would like to answer that question, Okay, I would be very interested to hear the answer. Maybe you should pick the person who you can either answer it yourself or you pick the person you think can answer it. Go on, you do it for me, that's fair. Because I've got two hands up here. So the blonde guy? No, 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 okay, okay, okay let's, to... just, let's just stick with answering that no, question. No, 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 I've got to add to your stuff. Sorry? Because you see, right? Yes. If I'm gonna take excuse me, excuse me. Uh, can you wait until No, you, you, you can just, just let No, she doesn't want to answer that question. No, I'm, I'm adding on to his, his challenge. Yes. Can you make my brother make it a bit harder, yeah? <laughs> my, my point is that, if you see, I'll take any single, any single of my criteria, what Christianity believes, and apply it to any other religion, and if any religion fits that criteria, it will be true. I will tell that no religion will fit that criteria, and no religion will be true, because our religion doesn't mean that you can fit other criteria and then make those religions true. So what I'm telling you is that what challenge you are, you are posing, right, will not will not sustain because no other religion will fit those criteria if, of which we believe is true. That's all I'm going to say. That's pretty much what we're trying to do. Okay, I mean, all we're trying to do, listen, I, I'm not trying to, you know, there's no way I can, I, I, I can't preach. I'm not, anyway, first of all, I'm not trying to preach to anyone. That's the first thing. Please, I'm not trying to preach. I'm sharing some ideas. That's actually only my duty. My duty is to convey the message to you. That's it. Okay? I can't force anyone or make anyone to believe anything. So, you know, if you've got faith and you believe it, that's fine. But some people, they claim that they can prove their religion to be true. They say, look, my religion is true because of this and this and this. 
Now you can say to me, you've got to believe in Jesus or go to hell. That's fine. But my proposition to you will be, why should I believe your religion? Why should I believe in it? Prove to me that your religion is true. Because to me, your religion is not any different in essence from Hinduism or from Buddhism or from any other religions that tell me that God became a man and, and died and by believing in that, I'll get salvation. So why your religion and not another religion? Why should I believe in your religion and not another religion? Okay. Now if you're going to tell me, for example, if you're going to tell me, that the, re the reason you should believe in Jesus is because He'll change your life. Because Jesus came into my life and He changed my life. I will say, well, wait a minute. I used to be a Christian, but I became a Muslim. And when I accepted Islam, it changed my life. And I'm sure I'll find a communist who will say the same thing. That communist has changed his life. I'll find a guy who started snowboarding, right? And he used to be a this and that, and it changed his life. So if, if you're saying that it's true because it changes your life, then if I can find something else that came and changed somebody else's life, how do you say, well, mine's true and that's false? How? Because they will claim, no, what I believe in had exactly the same effect. So you haven't really proved anything. Nothing. You haven't established anything. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. How is it, how is it that you... No, no, no. Uh, I, I'm not saying, I, I can answer. It's no problem. I can answer. Right? But I'm just interested. You can answer the question? Yeah. Go on. Yeah. Okay. So what I see is... Uh, I'm answering this question. Just... Okay then. Oh. Please, please let him answer. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting interesting. Man. I have feet of play like an X-Man. Well, I had feet of play for 40 minutes, believe me. My head was sweating, my feet, I, didn't, I had to move around just to go. Here's, here's an answer, okay? Um, what I see is, I see uh, world religions all over the place speculating <coughs> and making premises and having all kinds of ideas about what God is like and what he's done and how he's revealed himself. My criteria is this. God came into the world and he showed himself from the beginning, from Adam right the way through the Old Testament, through every single prophet who believed in God the Father, Son and Holy Spirit can be illustrated all the way through and culminated in the person of Jesus Christ who was God, who came down here, who revealed God to us, as John says at the beginning of his Gospel. And by that merit, just cleanly sits way above any other speculation that you may want to make uh, by other people coming down and telling us what God is like when <coughs> God actually came and told us what he loved him. So okay, I'll take that for Consistency throughout the okay. scriptures. Okay. That, but very fast. My whole talk was proposing exactly the same thing. My whole talk from beginning to end was proposing the same thing about Islam. My talk proposed from the beginning that the universal primordial religion of God is Islam. <coughs> okay? That we can prove it anthropologically, we can prove it historically, we can prove it by reference to scriptures, okay? Any religion that we can examine, in fact, we can find, in fact, they started off monotheistic and they became polytheistic, okay? Including what is called Christianity. Now, therefore, that claim is not universal. You haven't proven anything. And the other thing, the other problem is that your claim rests upon another premise. Your claim rests upon your belief in the Bible. Now, therefore, I want to ask the question, why should I believe in the Bible? I mean, after all, you can open the Bible and on page one, it tells us that the description of the creation, and it tells us that God created night and day before he created the sun. Now, today, most of us would read that and say, the guy who wrote that doesn't actually really know how the universe operates. How can you have night and day before the sun? Now, you could believe it if you lived in ancient Babylon, because that's the ancient Babylonian creation myth. They believed that there was an entity ruled of light, ruled by the sun, and there was an entity of darkness, ruled by the night. They didn't believe that the night and the day was caused by the rotation of, of the earth on its axis. So, the question I would ask is, why do we accept the author? Because your, the re your claim is, I believe this because my book, shows it, but then I would say, why should we believe in your book in the first place? Internal consistency. But it's, it's internal, it's inconsistent. I've given one example of an inconsistency. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Can you, just to reiterate, the etiquette of discussion, can you wait until I give you permission to speak, please? <laughs> Continue, 
Okay, there's uh, someone waiting here for quite a long time, so please. I accept that it's, it's always going to be an argument that you can say, I can't trust the top of the Bible, but I choose to believe the Bible is the ultimate authority and that it's got the word. And therefore, when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, I choose to trust in those words. I'd like to ask you what you think about those words if you were to accept that they are written um, and they are, they are correctly written and they are correctly written. You see, yeah, well, I mean, really what we're doing is like, a lot of this, I have to say, is just playing over an old tape that's been played and played and played, because a lot of, most of what we're discussing about has been going on over it. It's not hard to go over it again, okay? But if I do accept that, if I do, and there's some, there are some scholars, some Muslim scholars, who have accepted the premise that we will accept that the Bible is true. And they will still say, even if we accept that it's true, we'll still say that you can't prove what you want to prove from it. I don't accept that premise. I don't accept the premise that the Bible is true. But if I did, I would, the way I would explain it is, I would say every prophet would make that claim in his time. Moses, in his time, he was the way, he was the truth, and he was the life. He, he was the life. And, uh, and uh, Abraham would have claimed that in his time, because everyone would... would have had to follow Abraham, follow his way, and eternal life would have come through that. So I would say therefore that Jesus' claim, although it's phrased in a very unique and special way, but still it's a universal claim that every prophet would make in his time. It doesn't really prove uh, what you want it to prove. That's, that, that's what, how I, I would answer that. Okay. Okay. If the 
basis in history, I would begin to question things. I would begin to question things. So the thing is that we can always find someone, some professor somewhere, or some groups of people somewhere, writing in defense of something and saying some things, okay? I mean, we can all do that. It doesn't really establish something necessarily to be true. I mean, your statement about 5,000, I mean, the sheer facts of it are, is that the earliest biblical manuscripts that actually exist are from 195 years after Jesus. That's like having the only copy of the uh, the only copy of the Declaration of Independence being written in 1995. Let's make a comparison. Those are the the earliest complete biblical manuscript that we have got is the Codex Sinaiticus. That is dated about 340 years after the time of Jesus. That is a complete biblical manuscript. And interestingly enough, it has a gospel in there which is not in the present Bible. That's the gospel of the shepherd of Hermes taken out because it was too monotheistic. If you read, in fact, you can find it in the British Museum, you find very clearly the gospel of the shepherd of Hermes is a very clearly monotheistic tract denies and refutes any concept of Trinitarianism, for example. That's one of the reasons why it was taken out by the councils who decided what is going to be the Bible and what's not the Bible. And that goes back to a, you know, a, a thing that you mentioned uh, about, you know, I believe the Bible is the Word of God. I mean, but the, what Bible? I mean, until today the church has not decided what is the Bible. Until today they are changing words, putting sentences out, putting new ones in. So what is this Bible exactly that you believe in? The Catholic one, the Protestant one, the one they're revising, the newly revised one? It's very problematic. I do believe it's very, very problematic uh, to make a claim like that. You know, this is a big topic uh, as well. Uh, Again, uh, I don't really uh, agree with what that professor says. One of the problems being, and another problem being, is that we don't know who wrote the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Do you know what the first, do you know the first instance we actually have of those names being written down and the Gospels being attributed to those authors? Can you take a guess? Tell me. Okay. All the original Gospels, and the earliest ones we have being 195 years, those are the earliest manuscripts we have, 195 years after Jesus. That's a long time for things to change. Okay? Even then, they were all distributed anonymously. They don't have names. It's not like our Bible today, we open it up. These documents do not have any names. There is no attribution of the name of the person who wrote it. Absolutely none. In fact, the first person to tell us and to suggest to us who these authors of these Gospels were was Eusebius. Eusebius lived 325 years after Jesus. He was one of the guys present at the Council of Nicaea, held by Constantine. And he is the one who says, Matthew wrote Matthew, and Mark wrote Mark, and, and Luke wrote, uh, uh, wrote, wrote Luke. <laughs> He's the guy who said that. And he quotes from a guy, Arrhenius. Arrhenius lived 125, uh, 125 years after Jesus, but none of the writings of Arrhenius preserved. So we have no verifiable means to check that. So that's it. The first attributions of these Gospels, actually to say who wrote what, is 345 years after Jesus. How therefore can anyone honestly go around saying that they were eyewitnesses? We don't even know who they were. We don't even know who they were. Let alone the idea that if I give you a check for £20 and I just write Anthony on it, it's no one's going to accept it. That's a check for 20 quid. How about a book upon which we're going to depend the whole of our salvation? Mark? Who? Luke? Who? John? Who? Matthew? Who? Who are these Matthew, Mark, Luke and John? Very problematic. I really believe very... You know, you need an honest study here. A sincere... So you have to be... At the end of the day, everybody, this is about the day of judgment. This is about standing in front of God. This is about very, very important things. You know, it's not something any of us, not myself, not yourself, none of us, should take lightly. You know, we have to be really honest and sincere. I'm not saying you're not. Not at all. I'm just saying, you know, and myself as well, we all do. Uh, the gentleman right at the back. Um, I think it might help uh, what you uh, said before if you could explain why you converted from Christianity to the world. So your, your personal Okay. It, it sort of goes back to what we suggested here. I haven't actually mentioned. Could you keep this one brief, please?
it's something the Quran says that the closest in love are those who call themselves Christians. So, mashallah, it's a beautiful thing the Quran says. You know, and also says because they're humble people. You know, alhamdulillah. <coughs> so anyway, the things that it, it sort of goes back to the criteria. You see, my criteria that I, I like to that I think. Okay, I think we should apply common sense. That's what I think. I believe it. I said the way to know what's right and wrong are the same things we use to know what's right and wrong through the rest of our lives. Common sense. That's first and foremost what I think we should use. I had a guy who came into the mosque the other day. I had to sit down with him. It was very interesting up until the time when the guy started coming out with essentially, you know, Eastern mysticism and philosophy. And I said, wait a minute. Okay, because what he's basically at the end of the day doing is saying, well, listen, we don't really know what's real. Is anything real? You know? And I said, I said, yeah, you're right. It could be the Matrix where you could all be plugged in. Right? And sure enough, Orpheus is going to flush us down or whatever. Right? Stand up, they say, take the pill. It's like, come on. You know? It was all a computer generated thing. I mean, maybe it is, guys. Yeah? No, but I mean, <laughs>
But you said Jesus is God. Yes, yes, Jesus is God and he's the Son of God. So he's God and the Son of God? Yes. Okay. And in fact, the Holy Spirit is God as well. But there's not three gods, there's one God. Mm, he goes. Okay, so this goes back and forth. And I tell you about the maple leaf, you know, three leaves and one leaf. I tell you about the water and the this and that. And anyway, this conversation is going on for a long time, as you imagine it could. Okay. <laughs> um, and, and I thought I was doing quite well with this guy, you know. And so at the end of it, he sort of, he said, okay. He said, so you believe that Jesus is God? Yes. And you believe Jesus died on the cross? Yeah. Died on the cross is two for our sins. So you believe God died? And when he said that, I just, I didn't know what to say. Because it came to my mind that, no, I don't believe God died. I don't believe in a God that dies. I believe in a God that lives forever. And I just suddenly realized that, no, that just doesn't make any sense. I'm believing something unbelievable, contradictory, and I don't really know why I'm believing it. I've been taught all the doctrines, I've been taught the passages that are supposed to say these things, but no, it just didn't fundamentally make sense to me. So that was something that really, after that, I guess I, you know, really did not really believe in Christian doctrine anymore. But I did believe in Jesus. I believed in God. I believed in Je I believe what Jesus said. Fundamentally, I believed in what Jesus said about how we should live. And that's what I tried to make my life. I, Jesus said, the sum of the law of the prophets. So this is what I'm going to, this is what this is what this is what stuck in my mind. The sum of the law of all of the prophets is that you should worship, love the Lord your God with all your heart, and that you should love for others and love for yourself. I said, okay. Now that's something I can live by. I can love God, and I can love other people, and what I love for them, I love for myself. Because for me, the message of Jesus was not about a doctrine of some uh, incredibly difficult thing to believe and salvation on the cross. This was about a person teaching human beings how to live. Of course, that how to live had something to do with God, and loving God and worshipping God, but it was fundamentally about how to treat other human beings. Thus the Beatitudes, blessed are the meek. The peacemakers. You know, these beautiful things that Jesus was saying, for me that's what it was about and I tried to live my life like that. Uh, why I became Muslim is because I just found that the Quran, when I read it, when I read about Islam, it had all of those things that I agreed about, but none of those things that I didn't agree about. So the things that were confusing and didn't make sense to me, like the Trinity, okay, and like Jesus being God and even the crucifixion, didn't make much sense to me. But the Quran said, no, this is, you know, these things are not true, okay. But the things that did make sense to me about being good to others, about speaking the truth, about loving God, about worshiping God, it was all there. So for me, that's how it was, you know. That's my perception, you know. It's my common sense. I mean, I have to admit, at the end of the day, maybe what I call common sense and what you call common sense is different. I mean, I have to admit that. At the end of the day, we know that. There's no compulsion in religion. That's it. It's the Quran says it. But that's the way I perceive it. And I guess those are the reasons why, you know, I, I became Muslim. And I guess that's the reason why I still am Thank you very much. Uh, lady over here. Um, two questions, really. You said that. Um, Can you keep it to one, please? Because it's quite a lot of tea. father is the 
the devil, the father of lies. That's what he says to them. Okay, these people are like showing off. These people have made the laws of men more important than the laws of God. They've invented things. They've invented things, things that are not from the, from the teachings of God. They're not from the laws of God. Their own inventions, their own innovations. We have a word for this in Islam. Bid'ah. Innovation. Okay? These people had innovated. They had changed. Even, I was reading the same Isaiah I was reading, I thought, this is taking passage. I'm going I'm to I'm write this, I'm going to mention this in one of my khutbas to the Muslims. In Isaiah, it's mentioning, what sort of fast is this? What sort of fast is it when you fast and you don't do justice? When you fast and you don't do this and you don't do that, and you behave like this and you behave like that? It's the same thing. Yes, they believed in one God, okay? And maybe they claimed that they were following the law, but in fact, what have they done? They have innovated things. Their practice was a hollow practice. It was performing the outward rituals, but what was inwardly supposed to be there, the spirit of the law was not there. Okay, the letter was, but not the spirit. And this is something, in fact, we find happened. You can read this in the whole of the Bible. This is the same thing. The Jews, yes, they follow the letter. They even sometimes they don't follow. Sometimes they start worshiping Baal and all sorts of things. Okay, so it's the same reason that God is sending a messenger. It, uh, maybe they turned to idolatry. Maybe they have just lost the spirit of the law. Maybe they have introduced some new things. There are lots of different reasons why God sent a messenger to people. Okay. And on that basis, why does He send a messenger to many people? But that was saying because now, as you said, there are lots of different interpretations. That's good. Because we believe that, we believe that for whatever reason, God is not going to send another messenger. God has preserved the Quran, which He did not do with other scriptures. God has preserved the explanation of the Quran, and God and the Prophet Muhammad told us that God will send somebody, okay, to revive the religion every generation, okay. But He is not a prophet. He is not a messenger, okay. But there will be someone to revive the religion, because in a sense. Prophethood has been replaced by the Quran and the prophetic traditions because we believe that God has preserved it from all corruption, therefore it is a permanent source of reference. That is not necessarily something that the other prophets had. They may or may not have, but not necessarily. That's an explanation, an attempt at an explanation. Okay, thank you. Uh, Abraham, we find all of them's 
mention something when mankind goes to them, but they go to Jesus, and there is no mistake mentioned about Jesus. Jesus just says, go to Muhammad. Okay? So certainly Jesus has a very special place. He's the closest prophet to Muhammad. So some of the prophet called him, Prophet Muhammad called him my brother. He is my brother because he is the closest prophet to me. Okay? But none of that really shows that he is still anything more than actually a human being.
need that sacrifice, but the sacrifice is an act of piety and obedience to God. But even if you fulfill to perform it, you can still repent to God, you can still ask God, and you can still seek His forgiveness at any time in your life. So the sacrifice is not conditional. It's not a condition for God's repentance. Rather, the sacrifice is an act of piety. Okay? That's what the Quran says. It is not the flesh and blood that reaches Allah, but it is your act of piety that reaches Allah. Okay? So it's not the actual flesh and blood, it's not even the sacrifice, but it's the fact that you are obeying God and that He told you to do this. That is what is really important. But if you fail to, you can still repent. If you are sincere and God uh, is the most forgiving, the most merciful. So there's yeah. no way that men Sorry. can burn his way to God because men is the boy who's not free. Sorry? There's, there's no, no way, way that men could earn their way to God. Way to God. Because? Man is sinful. Man is sinful. Yes. This is, this, is, this is a big difference between the theology of Christianity and what Islam teaches. Islam teaches us that God knows perfectly well that we're sinful. In fact, that's how He created us. He created us with weaknesses. He created us with deficiencies. God does not expect us to be perfect because then God would be expecting something from us that we could never achieve. So the whole issue that Christian theology brings up is that you can't, uh, that you cannot stand before God and you can't, how can you be like God since God is perfect and you're imperfect? It's not an issue in Islam. Because God knows that He created us like that. In fact, there's a very interesting saying of the Prophet Muhammad. He said that if you did not sin and then repent for your sins, then God would remove you and He would bring another people who did sin and they would repent for their sins and God would forgive them. Meaning that through sinning and then repenting for our sins, that is how we realize the reality that God is truly forgiving. That is the way that we recognize that God is forgiving. How can we talk about forgiveness without sin? If you never sin, how will you know what forgiveness is? Because there's nothing to be forgiven because you never did anything wrong in the first place. <coughs> yes? You understand? Okay, if you never did anything wrong, there'd be nothing to forgive. Yes? So in order to know and understand the reality of what is forgiveness, you have to sin. And God created, yes, you do. You have to sin. You, you look confused or not? Do you have, why? No, because you mentioned about Yes. Like after we sin, we repent. But don't you need any no. to reach out to God? You can ask God directly. Why? Can't God hear you? Can't God see you? Who is going to hear you better than God? Who is more capable and who can forgive sins except God? Why do you need an intermediary? This is the thing that God gets angry that you should think that anyone can do what He can do, can hear you like He can hear you, can forgive you, and He is the only one, in fact, who can forgive you. Okay? But worship, worship, that the, the God has given us worship, that is for our good. That's because living our life like this is good for us as human beings. Okay? So when I pray five times a day, that's good for me. That helps me as a human being. It helps me live my life in a good way. And helps me to develop a character where I am close to God. And so with fasting, and so with sacrifice, and so with being good to your neighbor, and not being rude to your parents. These are all, in fact, acts of worship. They are good for the human being individually, and good for the human being collectively. Okay, that's the benefit, and that's the reason why God told us to worship Him. It's not like some people imagine, you know, in like the God games you play on the computer, the more worshiper the God gets, the stronger He gets, you know? It's not like that. Okay, God doesn't need us. Who are we? Nothing. God doesn't need anything. He's self-sufficient. So the worship is good for us. Okay, that's why we've got the worship. That's why God has taught us these actions of worship. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we're running short of time, so I'll just take one last question. Uh, can you please clearly raise your hands if you've got a question? Uh, I'll try and take a new face. So this gentleman here. I just want to say that I enjoy your talk a lot. I come from Muslim country. Despite that, I haven't really had a chance to hear the Muslim faith being um, explained thoroughly and really enjoy that. Um, coming back to your one of your earlier questions, your challenge, so to speak, about the criteria that um, what Christians put on their religion, I was just wondering if you could uh, perhaps give your point of view. What is your criteria on this okay. religion as a... Uh, okay. Uh, I, I sort of mentioned it, but maybe I didn't clarify it, but... Um, 
things is that part of something is less than the whole. A part of this bit of paper yeah, is less than the whole of this bit of paper, right? We all accept that. It's universal. You won't find an Eskimo or Bedouin, right? Or a guy in New York or wherever they may be. He doesn't agree with that. They all agree. Okay? One of the th other things that we agree is, is you don't get something coming from nothing. Yeah? I mean, although you see the magician pull something out of his hat, right? You know it's a trick. These are some things, there are some things common to human beings. We all share them. Those are the things that we need to use to understand what is true and what is false. And then, this is my method. Then what I do is I use those things in order to prove that there is a God. That there is a creator. That there is something that created this universe because it couldn't have come from nothing. Okay, you don't get all the spontaneously arising from the chaos, and there's nothing in the whole human experience that leads us to believe that that's the case, right? And then I will go on to say, well, how do we know there's a? We know there's a God. We know there's something wise, something powerful that brought this universe into existence. But I want to know more about this wise, powerful being. Is there one, two, three, twenty, a hundred? Did they all get together and make the universe? Okay. So if we use our reason and we try and think about that. We would come to an understanding that, look, God has to be different from the universe. If God is not different from the universe, then he's part of the universe. And if he's part of the universe, then that God is not actually God. It's not the creator, it's created. So we still need an explanation as to how everything came into existence. Anyway, very, I'm cutting out a whole lot of stuff, right? But ultimately, through this process, we can understand that there is one God. One infinite, self-sufficient being that is separate and distinct from the creation. That is how we explain and understand there's a God. That's how we explain reality. That explains everything. Now, anything for me that contradicts that has to be false. Okay? For example, that God is a man. Because man is created. Man is finite. We know God exists by looking at man. When we see man, we say, he proves that there's a God because he needs a creator. He's got eyes, they need to be made. He's got ears, they need to be made. Created. And creator must be different. <laughs> Can't be the same. Okay? So therefore, that's my criterion. That's why when I read Bhagavad Gita and the bit I got to, and Harry Krishna is the manifestation of God, he closed it. I said, forget it. I don't want to go any further. Because anyone tells me that some human being is God or a manifestation of God, that just does not fit. How do I even know there's a God then? What's the whole basis on which I understand that God exists? It has to be this process of reasoning. Okay? So that's my fundamental premise that I use really to understand. Uh, you know, uh, and, and to really also what I believe is one of the things that really indicates that Islam is the truth. That's very approximately my process of reasoning that I use. And it doesn't mean that I don't, there's not spirituality involved. It doesn't mean I feel all those things. Islam changed my life. That's what I believe. It did change my life. You know, I do feel I have a relationship with God. I feel that when I worship God, I feel peace and happiness and tranquility. Those things are all, but they are subjective. That's for me. You know, I, I, no, we can't all sit down and examine that. You can't cut me up and say, where's this piece in there? Let me see. You know, you can't do that. I just can claim it. So, yeah. Can I comment? Sorry. You can make a comment afterwards. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This is... Uh Islam, please uh, feel free to contact us 
with our email address being islam at uh, imperial.ic.ac.uk or you can just contact any of our um, uh, committee members the vice president standing here on my right uh, there's some uh, refreshments outside so feel free also if uh, Abdul Rahim is willing to stay behind he's, I'm sure he's more than happy to take further questions thank you very much thank you.